morning. Welcome to our third day of West 2015. We've had a terrific conference so far, and uh, we have a terrific wrap-up lineup today. It's my privilege and pleasure to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Vice Admiral Jan Tai, who's commander of the Fleet Cyber Command and commander of the 10th Fleet. As Commander Fleet Cyber, she is the Navy component to the U.S. Cyber Command, and as Commander 10th Fleet, numbered fleet commander, she supports all Navy operators worldwide. Vice Admiral Tai was commissioned as an ensign, special duty, cryptology, in 1984 from the U.S. Naval Academy. She studied Russian at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, and later attended the Naval Postgraduate School where she earned her PhD in electrical engineering and her master's in applied mathematics. Her previous tours have included command of the 2,800 multi-service and multi-agency personnel at the Hawaii Regional Security Operations Center. She has served as the Cyber Command Deputy J3 and recently served as interim president at the Naval Postgraduate School, most recently as Deputy Fleet Cyber and 10th Fleet. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Vice Admiral Jan Tai. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, really a pleasure. Those of you from the East Coast who haven't checked, it's 31 and snowing, uh, near Baltimore anyway, which is where I check, near my home. Um, it would be easy and perhaps fun to spend the next hour or so talking about cyber and our operational challenges. Um, okay, maybe I have a warped sense of what, what constitutes fun, but uh, I'd first like to provide a bit of context. I know we do have multi-service uh, folks that participate in this forum and, and who will see this online, so I wanted to give a little bit of time putting things in perspective and in context with respect to the Navy's approach to information dominance uh, before I dive down more into the fleet cyber and more into cyber warfare in particular. Um, in this, this journey really began in 2009 when the Navy took a truly unique approach to tackling the information age. Uh, on the Navy staff, we combined resource portfolios of the N2 and the N6 into an information dominance portfolio. Uh, under a single three-star, the DCNO, who we have here with us today, Vice Admiral Twig Branch, um, with the intent of creating an operational advantage by fully integrating the Navy's information dominance capabilities in a way that optimizes decision-making and maximizes warfighting effects. Um, that is the combination of intelligence, all intelligence, imagery intelligence, signals intelligence, human intelligence, um, combined with command and control and data links and cyber and electronic warfare. Um, we added platform-based capabilities as well in the form of EP3 and SPA aircraft, unmanned ISR systems, uh, the E2 Cs and Ds, can't say that without smiling, um, cooperative engagement capability, tactical data links, implications for uh, Navy integrated fire control counter air. That transformation started at the Pentagon and has continued to permeate our Navy organizations and workforce ever since uh, we have established the information dominance core and information dominance warfare qualifications that bind it and operationalize these critical warfighting specialties as a whole, which is much greater than the sum of the disparate parts. Uh, we've created an information dominance strategy to transform information in warfare to information as warfare. And it revolves around three distinct pillars. One is the assured command and control, the second is battle space awareness, and the third is integrated fires. And these ideas and these capabilities are considered at the OPNAV level inside of resourcing, inside of planning, programming, budgeting, and execution together as a whole as opposed to distinctly separate and not worrying about how they fit together. And so um, we believe that that is a, a very uh, strong capability that the Navy brings and an, a unique approach of, uh, you know, of tackling the problems that we have. 
In January 2010, the next step in that transformation occurred with the uh, commissioning of Fleet Cyber Command and the reestablishment of the 10th Fleet, reporting directly to the CNO as an Echelon 2 Command and as Navy Component Commander to U.S. Cyber Command and Service Cryptologic Component Commander to the National Security Agency, also a Navy Component Commander to STRATCOM for space. And finally, in October of 2014, we established the Navy Information Dominance Forces Type Command, commensurate with other Navy Type Commanders, whose, whose mission is to generate readiness for all information dominance capabilities, and especially me as Operational Command at Fleet Cyber and other operational commanders around the fleet. It's an exciting time for our warfare domain and I would say that we are at the end of the beginning when it comes to information dominance. If we dive down uh, more specifically into my responsibilities at Fleet Cyber Command and 10th Fleet, on a daily basis we conduct interrelated complementary missions. It's not all information dominance missions that uh, reside at, at Fleet Cyber, it is a subset. But we serve as the Navy's central operational authority for Navy networks and communications, SIGINT, information operations, electronic warfare, and space. My missions are directed by a single commander and a supported staff who are principally responsible for planning and employing the force. The missions are actually executed through a task force structure um, composed of 22 operational commands around the globe. Um, to be clear, my role inside of this Navy construct is as operational commander. I'm not the CIO, I'm not the information assurance policy generator, I'm not a resource sponsor or an acquisition authority, I'm not a systems command or a tech authority or a readiness or sustainment organization, although all of them are here today. And thank you for being here. We have all of those elements and that's the goodness um, uh, of where we are in our maturation. We have codified all of those elements uh, within our Navy um, and we have to all work together harmoniously in order to execute the operational missions that I have and that we have throughout uh, the maritime um, missions. I also play a supporting role to other operational commanders as do all operational commands at one port, point or another. But unlike on op other operational commanders, my operating forces do not flow in and out of my operational control. Uh, my operational forces do not flow in and out of my AOR, if you will. Fleet cyber operational forces are operating globally and always on. Our mission never sleeps and we cannot accept a readiness bathtub in this operational domain. Accordingly, our type, our type commander, Navy I, uh, Information Dominance Forces, will have the challenge of generating readiness for Fleet Cyber Command operation, operational forces while we are on mission and while we continue to grow and expand the operational force and our operational capabilities. And yes, you just heard me say grow and expand at a conference whose theme is lower budgets, higher demands. Well, we got the higher demands right. And clearly the threat in this domain is continuing to grow and mature and Navy is making choices and investments to keep pace with this threat. Operations over the last three years and demonstrations that we've been able to accomplish have driven focused and planned investments in personnel and capabilities amounting to nearly $1 billion over the period from FY14 to FY20. Of course, this is built on the premise that our future year budgets will not be sequestered. And if sequestration hits or even continues to loom, it, we will have an increasingly difficult time addressing this very real and present danger in cyberspace and threat to our national security and maritime warfighting capability. These future investments are being informed by Task Force Cyber Awakening, which was chartered by the CNO to gain a holistic view of cybersecurity risks across the Navy and beyond just our corporate networks. Task Force Cyber Awakening will make, recommendation, will make recommendations on how we organize and resource capabilities to mitigate that risk. 
uh, Task Force Cyber Awakening is also led by Vice Admiral Twig Branch and is overseen by an executive board that is, in cha that is chaired by the Vice Chief of Naval Operations and Secretary Stackley, uh, ASNRDA. In addition to these future investments that we are looking at, um, we are also at building 40 Navy teams as part of U.S. Cyber Command's Cyber Mission Force to meet the evolving threat. This will be our expeditionary maneuver elements. And whether we like it or not, cyberspace is an established operational warfighting domain. Just like maritime and air and space domains, cyberspace must be defended, and through cyberspace we'll be capable of delivering effects against adversaries who wish to do our nations and allies harm. Unlike our other domains, however, in cyberspace, it's insufficient for us to solely focus on peer, nation state, military competitors. Currently, current evolving threats in cyberspace today range from non-nation states to nation state actors, including criminal organizations, hacktivists, and insiders. The threats that concern us aren't purely cyber mischief or even spy versus spy. As recent history has made clear, the rising tide of information technology propels unpredictable world events. Data compromises and information loss generally threaten our economy and our way of life. In all ways, information disruption is crippling. Whether it stems from malfunction or malfeasance, it is moot if the results are the same. We lose freedom of action, we lose prosperity, we have increased operational risk, and at worst, we have property, damage, injury, or death. In the United States and around the world in 2014, the year was marked by both criminal and destructive cyber attacks, largely delivered against the private sector. The nature of the malicious operations have ranged from criminal to for-profit intrusions to a nation state actor attempting to assert its will in the destructive attack on Sony's pictures. And in between, we saw cyber mischief in denial of service attacks and hacks against social media networks such as Twitter and YouTube. We were also hit in the pocketbook when millions of retail customers saw their credit card and private information flow into the hands of cyber, cyber criminals from the hacks on Target, Home Depot, Staples, and eBay. Additionally, the Sony hack demonstrated that cyber attacks on even non-critical infrastructure can, can still take aim at fundamental American values. And those are values of all open societies, our freedom of speech. While destructive attacks have, did affect Sony's business plan, it did not succeed in squashing the movie entirely. That was left completely to the movie critics. Okay, you're awake, I'm good, that's good. Finally, we saw hacks related to criminal and potential espionage activities across the healthcare business, the financial industries, the defense industrial base, and many US government uh, beyond uh, DOD um, networks. The bad news is that's just what we know about. Uh, there could be other intrusions or attacks yet undetected or possibly unreported. It requires neither a crystal ball nor exquisite intelligence to anticipate that this trend will continue to grow in 2015, as evidenced by the most recent Anthem attack. I'm sorry, hack, not attack. Malicious cyber operations against both the private and public sectors have re-energized our national dialogue about what government and private entities can do to deter cyber intrusion or attacks. I see those, that discussion potentially in three different parts. First, what must the government do independent, independently to protect national security and its citizenry? Do we legislate? Do we regulate? Do we mandate? Who can and should be accountable for the network defense of the nation? These are questions, not answers. Uh, the second part of the question is how can government and industry collaborate and share information to fully take advantage of the strengths of each and in turn strengthen the network for all. The power of working the problem collaboratively, sharing lessons learned and threat information across government, defense, and in the private sector 
and with partners internationally cannot be overstated. We need to be hunting as a pack in this space as opposed to independently because of the power of bringing all of our information together. The third part of this question and probably the least explored part is what must the private sector do to protect itself? I believe that investments in network security and defense are quite simply investments in mission success. That is a choice that can be made or omitted by the public, defense industries, or the government sectors. But those of us who understand the risk to mission or to profit or to pub public trust view this as a mandatory and integral part of doing business, and the Navy is making that choice to invest in our defense. Much of the risk to our networks, and especially the risk to private net sectors, networks come from non-nation state actors and criminal organizations, and those threats can often be defeated with good cyber hygiene and commercially available security produ products. But it takes an active commitment and management and I would also say ownership of the problem. As many of you, if not all of you, know in the Navy, we refer to this as commander's business. And it's not just this commander's business. Yes, my mission is to operate and defend Navy networks, but every commander who touches or depends on the Navy network has a role in securing and protecting it. Essentially, commanders cannot leave it to the CIOs or the IT geeks and here at FCA, I use that term affectionately, since you can't even spell geek without a double E. Com okay, you're still awake. So far, so good. Commanders must understand their risk to mission based on their cybersecurity posture or be vulnerable to mission failure. And similarly, CEOs and COOs must understand their risk as if it were directly tied to their market share, because it is. I'd like to delve a little bit into the operational perspective as it's relevant to all who seek to defend and secure their networks. I think we at Fleet Cyber Command well understand that U.S. Navy freedom of action is necessary for all missions that our nation expects us to be capable of carrying out, including winning wars, deterring aggression, and maintaining freedom of the seas. As the operational commander, I direct operational forces to secure, operate, and defend U.S. Na Navy networks as part of the larger DOD networks. We operate the, net the Navy network as a warfighting platform. And by network, I include, I include all enclaves, telecommunications, and space assets. We must make that network available and defend it from intrusion, exploitation, or attack. And when necessary, fight through it to achieve operational missions. Meanwhile, our adversaries are rapidly acquiring sophisticated tools. Plus, they know how to use them. Success for us means winning every day. Success for adversaries can result from one single score. As I suggested, I do not fully control all aspects of this warfighting platform, and specifically the intrusion attack surface or that opportunity that we present to adversaries to get into our networks. Our networks have inherent vulnerabilities. They could be misconfigured or insufficiently patched. Users do not always fully understand the ramifications of their online behaviors and unintentionally open doors to malicious actors. If we could close every single one of those holes, and minimize the attack surface to the bare minimum uh, exposure. A new zero day would be published the next day, such as heart bleed or shell shock, that expands the attack surface in both unimaginable ways and often unquantifiable ways in terms of being able to assess our risk. So we work with the TICOMs and the SISCOMs and our mission partners every day to minimize that attack surface by educating both commanders and users, modernizing unsupported systems, improving patch maintenance and configuration control, inspecting compliance, and reducing our collective risk. We combine this approach, this uh, that I would call shaping the attack surface, with a defense in-depth approach 
from the boundary of the internet to the individual host devices inside the Navy networks. We leverage all source intelligence to inform and monitor emerging threats and arm our network defenses. Additionally, we conduct surveillance and reconnaissance inside of our networks to detect adversary activities or adversaries trying to penetrate our networks or moving laterally by layering sensors, analysts, and hunters inside that network. We also use intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance to trigger countermeasures that prevent the intrusion in the first place or lateral movement or exfiltration of data. Or we use that information to preemptively maneuver our network out of harm's way when we see a threat coming. As threats are discovered, we must pursue them quickly and aggressively. Tide and tide, time and tide, wait for no man, no woman, or cyber hunter. And neither will our most dangerous cy cyber adversaries who have the ability to move rapidly and cover their tracks to deter our pursuit of them. This is the nature of cyber operations. The defense can nev neither sleep nor remain stagnant. It must dynamically transform to meet today's threats and anticipate tomorrow's. Accordingly, my vision for Fleet Cyber Command is quite simple. To conduct operations in and through cyberspace, the electromagnetic spectrum, and space to ensure Navy and joint freedom of action and decision superiority while denying our adversaries the same. We can only win in these domains through a collective commitment to excellence and by strengthening our alliances with entities across the US government, Department of Defense, academia, industry, and our foreign partners. We're currently in the process of updating our strategic plan. It has a slightly shorter gestation period than a human baby, but it has very similar characteristics for me. Um, we're planning to get that out by the end of this month. And an outcome of that strategic plan will be to be capable of measuring the value that we bring to Navy and Joint Commanders based on our ability to accomplish my five top tier goals that I'd like to talk to you a little bit about. As I said, we intend to operate the Navy as a, network, as a war fighting platform. We didn't acquire it that way. We didn't buy into sustaining it in that way, but we want to operate it in that way. And what that means is um, tracking and measuring the availability of that network for all missions across the Navy and making sure it's secure, preventing penetrations of the network. If penetrated, quickly responding to it to prevent lateral movement or uh, password escalation and privileges of people who don't deserve those. So top priority, number one goal is operating the, net, the network as a warfighting platform. My second mission, and as I talked a little bit about, I also have responsibilities uh, as the service cryptologic com component commander to NSA, is to conduct tailored signal intelligence. And that comes in perhaps three different forms. One is providing capabilities forward uh, to our tactical platforms uh, for maritime commanders forward in the form of teams. The second is providing expertise and capabilities and in some cases mission accomplishment for the National Security Agency. And the third piece is sort of a bridging piece that we do at our cryptologic centers, which is leveraging each, the strength of each, our tactical SIGINT capabilities that are forward, our national capabilities that are global, and bringing those together to benefit the maritime commander with the national capabilities and to benefit national uh, intelligence priorities based on leveraging what we can do forward in the operational space. And so we, we have a commitment to uh, continued excellence in this part of the domain, and we are going to track and monitor our success in that. Um, my third goal is about delivering more fighting effects. You heard integrated fires on the strategy from information dominance. We have a role in delivering warfighting effects across electronic warfare, information operations, and cyber. Um, my staff under the 
under U.S. Cybercom also has a role in, as a command and control element, Joint Force Headquarters Cyber, in which we command and control on behalf of two of the COCOMs, combat mission teams of U.S. Cybercom's Cyber Mission Forces. And so tracking our maturation as those teams grow and develop capabilities that are integrated with warfighting plans and our ability to command and control them is something that we're going to be measuring and tracking um, as we go forward. The fourth goal is something that could have been a subset of the number one goal, operate the network as a, as a warfighting platform. But it's so important and so needed that we've raised it up to be a tier one goal. And it's something that we've been pursuing but not quite gotten our arms around for at least five years, probably longer. Um, and that is to create shared cyber situational awareness. Uh, in order to operate and defend Navy networks, I have to be able to see them. I have to be able to understand where the vulnerabilities are, have to be able to understand um, where they may not be operating properly, and I have to be able to track and monitor potential adversaries in those networks, a cop, if you will, an ability to bring all of that network security, network operations data together in a way that we can truly command our force um, to make available and, and secure Navy networks. I also need that kind of information to be available to my mission partners, other Navy component commanders, and numbered fleet commanders so that they can tailor their view of the network in, in a similar way to meet their missions. So as they're looking at the missions they're trying to accomplish, what risk is posed by network risk um, to those overall missions that they're, that they're trying to accomplish. So this is a critically important um, next step for us in terms of being able to bring all of that information together in a way that benefits both me in my supported commander role, but also in a supporting commander role to all other operational commanders around the fleet. And then finally, my fifth goal, clearly we are in the middle of a build of teams for U.S. Cyber Command Cyber Mission Force, and the Navy has 40 of those, and we have responsibility to deliver trained, qualified, and certified teams to U.S. Cyber Command, and the, depending on the type of team and where it's aligned, the command and control structure will, will vary, but those, the three types of general types of teams that we have out there are the national mission teams that are slated to defend the nation against cyber threats, the combat mission teams that are being created to support COCOM requirements in cyberspace, and then cyber protection teams that go across different elements. We have service cyber protection teams um, that will support Navy in mapping key terrain and actively defending against threats, but there are cyber protection teams for the combatant commanders, there are cyber protection teams for DISA, and it's intended to be a maneuver force that can either, in a preventative way, go forward and map key terrain and install sensors and assure missions of other warfighting commanders, or in the event of um, malicious activity, uh, surge forward to go investigate, clean up, pursue the adversary um, in cyberspace. And so that's, that's goal number five, and that drives us forward. Um, we have measures that we're going to be measuring ourselves actively against each of those goals, and 18-month um, measures that we're trying to get to, but really, these are these are uh, a longer term, longer term goals that get us down the road and continue to mature our capabilities and our ability to command and control this force. So I posed several questions uh, across the public and private sectors and what we do. Um, I don't have great answers for that. But as it pertains to hunting as a pack, um, I think we cannot do this alone inside of Navy, certainly not inside of DOD. It's gonna take all of us to make a difference in our cybersecurity postures. Um, industry, national labs, university partners, 
um, we need to be engaging to help ensure our future capabilities are created and aligned uh, to Navy requirements. With that, I thank you and look forward to your questions. Good morning, ma'am. The first question is from Lieutenant Nathan Rolfe from NCIS Cyber Division, and he asks, you corrected yourself regarding Anthem, referring to the activity as a hack instead of an attack. When does malicious cyberspace activity break the threshold to be classified as an attack, and how does choosing not to label activity as such hinder military response in the domain? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think that clearly, because of the newness of this warfighting domain, um, we have, we as a nation, we the DOD, um, have been engaged in, in a lot of dialogue um, to try to get at you know, what's going to constitute standards and norms of behavior. International law is based on those things. And since we don't have a lot of runtime with cyberspace and in this domain and with this evolving uh, type of actions, there is no standard. Um, there is no standard of behavior because we haven't quite been around long enough. There hasn't been opportunity enough. And so, you know, I, I try to guard my words to limit attack to um, be those things that are destructive in nature, either destructive of data or destructive of property. Um, but I would say that, you know, as an in the international community does not have that completely figured out. Um, and it's going to take some time before, you know, we sort of settle in on what we think the standard is. That being said, it doesn't prevent the discussion in terms of law of armed conflict use of, you know, what constitutes use of military force, um, what violates sovereignty, that debate, it's policy debate, not an operational debate, policy debate that goes on at the highest levels of our government and with international partners, and it will continue to go on. Um, and, you know, we have to be active participants in it, but again, not the policy makers, we are the execution of of that policy for our government. So that's a great question, and I think that that debate will continue. Um, we do have the Talon Manual as a, as a, as a piece of liter, you know, literature to um, use and talk about, uh, but not necessarily internationally accepted as the standard. And so I think the discussion goes on, and, and that's a good thing in our country particularly. So. Thank you. Next question is from CTNC Hall from Navy Cyber Unit 23. Oh, this is going to be hard. How do you see the Navy service cyber protection team's impact in the fleet? Well, as you probably know better than anyone, we are really on the front end of the build for the service uh, cyber protection teams. We're um, very excited about it, and as I alluded to in my comments, uh, we're looking at different types of mission for those service cyber protection teams. We have them roughly aligned geographically with the Navy component commanders and numbered fleets, but available to surge in the event of incident or incident response. And we have used those teams um, in missions that range from um, working with foreign partners to go in and take a look and help them secure their networks, so whereby we, if we're going to connect and operate with them um, in military operations, we would want to know that the quality and the security of their networks are good. We've, we've used some of the teams in that way. Um, we've used the teams to respond to what appears to be malicious activity in order to go verify isolate, prevent, clean up, restore integrity. Um, and I think uh, the final piece, and this is, a, this is um, an even harder piece, will be insofar as we use those teams to help provide mission assurance to the other numbered fleets and Navy component commanders, taking a particular mission thread and mapping out all the components of that and well understanding 
um, what within the network does that particular mission, fill in the blank, ballistic missile defense, um, integrated air and missile defense planning, whatever the mission thread is that that uh, commander wants to um, focus on, we go map the terrain and look for vulnerabilities and or solutions to mitigating any risk to that particular function to assure the mission of the supported commander. So I think this is, um, again, this is capacity that we haven't had in the past. We have layers of defense. We have uh, our CNDSP uh, Task Force 1020 and the regional um, FIOX uh, looking at data and looking at alerts coming off of the sensors and doing analysis and focusing either globally at 1020 or regionally at the various FIOX. Um, but this is intended to be a maneuver element that we can go out and focus either on a mission or focus on a particular um, event that is happening and be rapid in our response. And so I'm very excited to have uh, the additional cap capability and capacity that we're building, identifying the tools that um, are required for those teams across that mission set, um, figuring out how to pay for those tools, um, all of that is still wor some work, there is still some work to be done, but, but I think this gives us a lot of capability across the Navy to um, make a difference against the threats that we're facing. Thank you. The next question comes from Admiral Dick Mackey. Uh, is, it, is it possible to provide assured C2 to our operational warfighters? Is it possible? Um, I think this is a this is a problem that it obviously is larger than cyber. Um, you know, it gets into uh, several of our information dominance capabilities, and we have, you know, in the last uh, several years, been very focused on operating in a denied environment and looking for both technological and uh, more recently operational ways in which we can make a difference there. And I think we. Um, I think we are moving to, to a place where we will continue to reduce risk to assured C2. I don't know that you can ever say, um, I, I think we'll be able to provide capability for the command and control. Um, another aspect, as you well know, that we're working on is how do we operate in a reduced bandwidth environment, for example, and that can be um, extended over to how do you operate in potentially a compromised network environment. Um, the fight through concept is something that we've been working on, and by we I mean the numbered fleets, the mission, our mission partners, in how they, they will conduct business if they're operating in a um, denied or restricted environment. And so we're helping with that. We're going to take that idea and move it into the network domain and look for things we can do within the maneuver space um, to make those capabilities even more assured for them. But I think it's, um, you know, I'm the one who's, who, who wants to believe that we can provide that 100% of the time. At the same time, we're going to help figure out what if you don't have that. And that could happen even if it's not an adversary. Um, you know, there may be technical difficulties that result in not having what you thought you would have, and so how do we, how do commanders respond to less capability than they expected with innovation and, and practicing it and exercising it is, is how we get the juices flowing to, to figure some of those operational tactics and techniques out, so. I got a thumbs up from Admiral Mackey, so I think we're good. Next question. The next question comes from CTN2 Roth from Navy Cyber Unit 23. What do you feel is necessary to properly train and equip cyber protection teams to be effective amongst the different warfare areas in the fleet? Like I said, the hardest question is going to come from our CTN2s. Um, now, that, that, that's a terrific question. I think we have. Um, a lot of our brightest minds really working on that. We've got the beginnings of what training looks like, but I don't think we have uh, the end of it. And the reality is, 
um, our national mission forces, those, those, they have cyber protection teams as well. Their cyber protection teams came on first. Um, they've done actually a lot of thinking about what equipping and training looks like. And we're trying to determine whether that um, comes down to the service level directly or whether we have unique capabilities that we need to build in the force. I believe that we probably need to build some unique capabilities into our force, but whether we build it into every cyber protection team or we build some special cyber protection teams to be capable of going into places other than corporate networks. Um, it's different skill sets, it's different tools, it's different knowledge, and so how we build teams to go look at other than corporate C2 networks is something that we're actually working on. I think there's great opportunity here. We haven't identified what those tools might be. Not sure that they're commercially available. Um, so we are, we are still a, a work in progress in defining the mission sets across the cyber protection teams. Again, we're just standing those up. Um, and we'll be over the next three years um, defining what the tools look like for that capability uh, moving forward. So it's a great question. It is uh, not a great answer, but uh, it is something that we're working very hard with our service partners and the National Mission Force on getting to. Any more CTNs in the room? Yay! Thank you. The next question is from Lyndon Newton at PAC Fleet. What can be done to advance planning and organizing for integrated fires? Well, as you well know from our Terminal Fury 11 days, um, you know, we've been on a path to... You aren't talking just about cyber, are you? Cyber? All. Okay. Um, in the, let's start in the cyber the cyber aspects though. Um, you know, we have been on a path from the US CyberCon level on down to create uh, cyber fires, um, cyber tasking orders, line items that are capable of being understood and integrating, integrated in with other non-kinetic and kinetic effects in an overall integrated um, tasking order kind of a, kind of a way. And so um, that you know, that process got created about in the 2010-11 time frame, and we've been exercising it ever since. Um, I think that uh, continuing to build on those processes, practicing them and exercise, which we have everything from Cyber Flag, a, a focused and dedicated um, cyber exercise at the tier one level, um, which can, is continuing to evolve bringing more of the COCOM play into that exercise as opposed to, you know, being more strictly um, cyber people at the exercise, I think will help mature us in that domain. But then integrating into the other tier one exercises with just another part of that exercise, um, bringing those capabilities and, you know, in integrating in, in at the COCOM level and other levels is you know, how we're going to continue to mature. I think we have the process for integrated fires. It's just a matter of fitting, you know, fitting all the different elements into it. Um, the Air Force has taken an approach in their cyber element to take all cyber operations that they're conducting and treat them as sorties, which from the Air Force perspective, makes a lot of sense. They think in terms, they, you know, they do think in terms of sorties, and so managing their force, everything they do, every, for example, um, sailor on a cyber protection team that goes forward with a laptop to check something out, he's going to be a line item on that ITO. I think that fits within their service culture. I don't think it fits within ours. And so as it pertains to, um, you know, strike missions as it pertains to offensive potential cyber fires or offensive effects. Um, integrating on the ITO makes a lot of sense to me. I'm not sure 
managing all of our defensive activities in that way does. So I'm more inclined to use our task force in operations, um, delegate commander's intent down, have task force commanders take those missions and, you know, and do it in the way that the Navy traditionally takes on missions and give them left and right limits and have them go pursue the operation in that way, which is a little bit different approach in the C2 structure. But we're, at the joint level, we're talking about how all of that works, which is uh, good and right. And uh, this was briefed, the Air Force briefed it at the commander's conference. And so looking to learn from different ways that we are all pursuing our mission you know, is, is also opportunity for us to say, well, maybe there is a better or different way to do business. And so we're maturing in this, in this war fighting area, but there's still plenty of maturation to go forward. So what else? Thank you, ma'am. I think we have time for one more question, and it comes from Nick Cheston at IBM. The president this week announced a new national cyber organization for protection of the country. What role will Navy Cyber play in that organization? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think I read the same articles probably you did about that. So um, we, don't, we don't know nearly enough to be able to answer that. Uh, from what I understand, the point is, is it, it's an integrative body uh, to bring the work of uh, many different government agencies together. Um, and so I would say that, you know, the role Navy would play would be our plug-in through U.S. Cyber Command, but I don't nearly know enough about how that's going to be executed, what exactly their roles and missions will be, um, to be able to really have a, have a good comment on how we exactly fit. But, um, you know, I think it's a great question, and, and I look forward to learning more about it as well. Um, Admiral Tai, on behalf of AFSIA and the Naval Institute, we just couldn't be more pleased that you made the trek out here today. Your time is precious, and I think we should give uh, Admiral Tai a big hand while I present her a book. We, th we think it's super appropriate to give you Joe Rochefort's War, uh, the odyssey of the codebreaker who outwitted Yamamoto at Midway. Uh, with your cryptologic roots, it should, you know, keep you, keep you company for a few nights of good reading. But uh, again, we thank you. It has an FCA bookmark inside. It's a Naval Institute Press book, and thank you for your precious time. <laughs>